Hey, hey, I'm Shay Warner, and you are listening to Casual Cattle Conversations. If you are ready to explore different management practices and focus on improving your operation and the beef industry, this is the podcast for you. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited you are listening. Hey folks, it is Shay here and welcome back to another episode. Today we are going to be talking about cover crops, but we are taking this conversation from a different angle than we did a few months ago. So on the show with me today is Keith Burns with Green Cover Seed. And why we're taking a slightly different angle at this is Keith is also going to be sharing some information on how to kind of communicate and build an agreement with your neighbors who maybe are farmers but don't have cattle. And how to just create something that's mutually beneficial for everyone if you are interested in doing more in the cover crop space. Keith also talks about how he got how they, his family started green cover seed, what that entails, and just some other important things to remember before you implement cover crops and just really figuring out if they're right for you. So with that, I do want to remind you that if you are interested in look or are looking for a speaker for your next event, whether that's a keynote workshop or a panel discussion, I am booking speaking gigs and would love to come talk to your audience. So with that, let's visit with Keith. Alrighty, Keith. Well, I'm excited to have you on the show today. I know you were able to join us for the Rancher Mind that was focused about cover crops and grazing cattle on those cover crops. And I really appreciated having you on that call with Daryl Oswald. And I'm excited to kind of take what we talked about there and go a little more in depth and really share that for everyone who's out there and in my audience. So thank you again for being on the show today. Yeah, you're welcome. It's my pleasure to be here. I enjoyed the previous time, and I'm sure this will be a great conversation as well. So, Keith, to get started, can you share just a little bit about your background in the agriculture industry and why cover crops? How did you get there? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Uh, my background actually started, uh, I, I went to University of Nebraska, got a degree in ag education. And so I actually spent 10 years teaching uh, agriculture and then kind of moved over into computers. Uh, kind of at the same time, my brother Brian went to uh, ag school, got his degree. He started farming. I came back 10 years later uh, when dad was retiring and we pretty well switched everything to no-till at that point in time. This had been in the late 90s. And so through that no-till organization, we we knew Gabe Brown and we knew all of these people who are now regenerative agriculture superstars, Jay Fuhrer, Daryl Oswald, all those guys, because they were all involved in that no-till movement initially. And then in 2006, uh, a, a man named by the name of Adamir Caligari came up from Brazil and he came to the No-Till on the Plains conference, and he was talking about diverse cover crop mixes and showing these pictures of how these farmers in Brazil were using these diverse mixes to improve their soil, to wake up their biology, to uh, increase the gains and the health of their cattle herds. And it was, it was really quite something because to that point, everybody who was using a cover crop was just doing one or two things, you know, sorghum sedan, maybe a clover, maybe this, maybe that. But putting them all together into that wild diversity hadn't really been done at any kind of scale. So after he showed that, Gabe Brown, Jay Fuhrer, those guys, they took that concept back to North Dakota. They did all these different experiments and showed that the diverse mix is so much more resilient to drought and so much more efficient with using moisture uh, that it was really pretty stunning to see those pictures. And so my brother and I saw that and we were thinking, man, you know, we need to try that experiment here in Nebraska to see if that will work as well. So we did in 2008, we got a little bit of money from SARE, Sustainable Ag Research and Education. We got like $5,000, put moisture sensors in the ground. And so we planted cover crops, probably 20 or 30 different species in monoculture strips and then several mixes. And we had these moisture sensors at one foot, two foot and three foot levels. And we monitored that on a daily basis. And so what we discovered as a result of all that was number one, uh, the mixes were much more efficient at using moisture than anything planted by itself in a monoculture. Exactly the same thing that they saw in North Dakota, except we had the, the data or the, the graph charts, the sensor charts to show it. 
So that's one thing that we saw from the very beginning is that the mixes, there was something incredibly powerful going on with these diverse mixes. Number two, we saw how well the cattle did on it. You know, the, we planted the rest of that field to this, you know, just the, the leftover cover crop mixture. And the cattle came off of there, you know, later that winter, just incredibly uh, well conditioned, you know, weaning big calves. Just We just liked everything we saw about that. And the third thing that we found out in doing this was that cover crop seed was hard to find. This is in 2008. And, you know, in order to get all those species, we had to really scrounge around and go here and go there uh, to, to, to get the mixes that we wanted. And so as a result of all those things, we said, hey, maybe we can sell this stuff. So uh, in 2009, we started Green Cover Seed and just kind of dipped our toe in the water a little bit with uh, shipping, you know, getting some seed mix by another company and just kind of reselling it. But we got started, did enough seed for about a thousand acres that year, just simply distributing it. We bought a mixer and got started on our own the next year. And, you know, that was 2010. And, and it feels like we've been building buildings and pouring concrete and hiring people and doing all this ever since. So we went from that thousand acres covered that first year uh, to well over a million acres uh, a year for the last several years that we supply seed for. I know I've had the opportunity to see your facility and get a tour and it's your Nebraska facility because I know you have multiple and it's it's very neat. It's um you have a fun company organization and culture too. I have the privilege of having a lot of friends who have worked with you guys. Now, I'm curious, you I talked a lot about these cover crops working in, you know, you, you really use the North Dakota examples and the Nebraska examples. Now, do you have customers in kind of all areas of the country? I'm really curious about how you're seeing cover crops used, you know, in arid climates, in wet climates and everywhere in between. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, and we, we do sell cover crops to all 50 states. Uh, we, and, and we do that every year. Um, it's, it's fun to send something to Alaska, send something to Hawaii. So, so it, certainly we cover the, the entire gamut. The majority, however, is probably in the 10 states. You know, if you take Nebraska and Kansas and kind of look at the states that surround them, uh, that would be kind of the main hub of, of what we do. But then there's, there's a decent amount in California. Uh, you know, it's a big agricultural state, so there's a lot going on out there. Uh, and, and Montana is another area that, that we ship a lot of to. And, and we get a lot of requests from other countries. We're shipping stuff to Canada. Um, I'm actually working on a container of cover crop seed to go to Japan right now. Uh, but it's just it's just difficult to export seed because it's a live agricultural product. There's there's just always a lot of regulations, red tape and paperwork that has to go with that. Yeah. Now I want to go back to, you know, you talked a little bit about the benefits of cover crops already. And can we dive a little bit more into that? So let's start with the soil health side of it and specifically with those diverse mixes, because that's what you specialize in. So you talked a little bit about using those moisture sensors. What else are you seeing as far as benefits? Well, you know, when we started, uh, and, and, and I tell people this all the time, you know, some benefits are accumulative. You don't see a lot of them in necessarily the first year or second year. You'll see a little bit more third year. They kind of build. And other benefits you see right away. And so the prevention of erosion, you see that right away. And, and really, that's that there should be that should be everybody's number one reason, because it doesn't matter how healthy you make your soil. If it washes away or blows away, all that work that you did just went literally down the river. And so just keeping the ground covered, keeping it from uh, protected from the wind and the water is hugely important. And so we see that as, you know, one of the most immediate impactful benefits mm -hmm. of cover crops. And, you know, here in Nebraska, we've had a couple of pretty dry springs. And then this year we got a decent amount of rain. And man, it's just hard you know, the heart sickening to see all of the soil that is moving and washing away in a wet spring. You kind of forget about that, you know, after after some dry years. So keeping the ground covered and, and protecting it from erosion is probably one of the most immediate benefits and, and certainly something that people can see right away. And, and then right on the heels of that, and, and again, with uh, your audience listening to this, you know, the ability to provide supplemental forage for livestock 
that's an immediate benefit as well because you grow it, you can graze it. And that's going to happen, obviously, that first year. And so we saw that from our early experiment in 2008, how well the livestock did on that. And, and people see that on a consistent basis. I will say this caveat, though. We always try to make sure that we say properly managed livestock will really increase soil health because improperly managed livestock can take you the other direction. And, and by improperly managed, it, it mostly has to do with just overgrazing, leaving them out there too long. And then you start getting the compaction. You started removing all that residue and now you can have erosion again. You, you just, you, you took too much and you went backwards in the goals that you were trying to achieve. So those are probably two of the things that are just really the most immediate. And then kind of the intermediary benefits, you know, we start to see the breakup of compaction. Uh, we start to see the building of organic matter, which, you know, it's a slow process, but but certainly cover crops are a huge boost to, to building that organic matter. As you do that, as you break up some of that compaction, you'll start to see your infiltration rates mm -hmm. uh, increase as well, which is really important because I haven't talked to a farmer yet that that doesn't agree with the statement that our precipitation events tend to be less frequent and more intense than they used to be. So we don't get rain as often as we used to, but when it comes, it oftentimes is very intense. So the, you know, having the ability to capture that, get it into the ground and hold on to it becomes even more important. And cover crops can be a big help with that, both on the infiltration side as well as the water storage side. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, the cycling and the production of nutrients would be one of those that it's pretty good the first year, but that continues to get better. And that could be whether we're producing nitrogen by having legumes in our mix or just simply cycling the nutrients that are already naturally in our soil. By having all that biological activity in there, we can free up some of the phosphorus and the potassium and, and the calcium that we know is in there, but it's locked up in a form that plants can't get to. Well, the cover crops through the biology that they're enhancing can really help free that up and make it available to the next crop. And then probably, you know, the one that wasn't even on a radar when we started this, and it wasn't on a lot of people's radar, is just simply that whole concept of improving the soil microbiome. You know, all of the biology associated with the soil, we just didn't understand it very well 15 years ago, and we just barely understand it now and learning more all the time. We just had Dr. Christine Jones from Australia here uh, at our farm last week for um, a couple days of field days. Wonderful experience. You know, she's so smart. But just the amount of biology that's in the soil is incredible. She she said that one seed, one barley seed, but I would assume this would apply to many seeds, can have up to 9 billion microbes both in it and on it. And so a really well-grown seed, a seed grown in a regenerative, highly biological environment, will bring its own microbes with it. And so then when you plant it, that plant will immediately have the right microbes to get it going. That whole area is, is incredibly fascinating. If, if uh, you've never listened to James White talk about rhizophagy and the rhizophagy cycle, you know that'll just about blow your mind about how plants literally are farming the microbes around their root system. It's just incredible. So that whole area of, of increasing and expanding and, uh, you know, making your soil microbiome better is is probably one of the biggest reasons that people should do cover crops. But it's one of the least recognized because you can't see them. You can't see them. And so a lot of times you just don't think about them. So I really appreciate you walking through some of those benefits. And I know those benefits are ones that um, Steve Swaffer talked about um, a few months ago too, as well on the episode. And I kind of want to take a step back and look at this from the bigger picture too. I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but I think anytime we talk about practice or a principle, there's a mindset shift with that. So when you're working with different farmers and ranchers, what's one of the biggest mindset shifts you see them make as it relates to implementing cover crops? Well, that's a great question. There's there's a lot of them. Uh, I think one of the biggest ones, in order to, to, to get the guy who's kind of on the fence to get them 
you know, to at least get out there and get in the game and to try it. One of the big ones is you just, you have to stop thinking about success in terms of production. How many bushels did I raise? How many pounds did I wean? And start thinking of it in terms of profitability. How profitable was I in what I did here? Uh, because, you know, with cover crops, when cover crops are integrated into a system management system properly, it should reduce your overall inputs. Now, will that reduce your yield? Not necessarily. It doesn't have to. But in some situations, it might. But if it's increasing your profitability, who really cares if it's reducing your yield? Because that's a mindset shift of getting out of being able to go to the coffee shop and brag about growing the biggest wheat yield or weaning weights or corn yield or whatever that is, and getting to the point of talking about, you know what, this was one of the more profitable years that we had because our inputs were so much less. You know, I grew 150 pounds of nitrogen with my cover crop. I saved two sprains because I had this great weed control from, you know, my rye thatch left over from the cover crop. You know, I fed hay you know, for only 45 days this winter because I was able to graze my cover crops so deep into the season, those sorts of things. So that's the mind that to me, that's the first and most important mind, sh you know, mindset shift is that we just have to think about things in the terms of profitability and not just strictly production. Once they get that into their mind, once they get that into their head, now it becomes, okay, so how can I be more profitable? Now it's much easier to say, well, do you want to grow your own nitrogen? You know, do you want to have this really thick ground cover to try to suppress weeds? What can we do to diversify your rotation so we don't have to use as many insecticides because you've gotten yourself into this, you know, bug cycle because you're only growing one or two things. Now all those other things become much more viable options because now I'm thinking about how do I become more profitable, not necessarily how do I grow more bushels or pounds? What do you think has gotten people so focused on the highest yields instead of profitability? Well, I think the, one of the biggest things is a crop insurance program, uh, to, to be honest, because crop insurance is based on yield. You know, I, I build up my APH, you know, my approved production history based on previous yields. The higher that can be, the more guarantee that I have, the bigger my safety net is. And so, and, and, and again, I'm not a proponent of getting rid of crop insurance or certainly I think needs to be some modifications to make it more fair and more equitable to all of the different crops um, across the board and not just a few, but certainly that gets people into that mindset of, I need to increase my APH. You know, I can't let my APH drop because that's my safety net for the future. And so I think that's one thing is, is just, you know, making sure that, you know, crop insurance, you know, helps people into that mindset. Uh, pride. <laughs> I mean, pride <laughs> is a big one. I struggle with it. Most people struggle with it, I'm guessing. Of, you know, you know, there are times when if we were honest with ourselves, we'd probably have to admit, I'd rather grow 200 bushel corn and have a little bit of profit than grow 120 bushel corn and have more profit. Because what did it look like from the road? You know, what are my neighbors going to think? You know, what am I going to tell the people at church or at the coffee shop? So, you know, pride, pride is always there, uh, you know, is the original sin and it continues to beset us even today. So I think those are all things. And, and then, you know, probably just, you know, that's the way, you know, they saw their dad doing it. And for many generations, it's just easy to get into that mindset. Now, if you talk to a banker, you know, a banker is going to be all about profitability. And so, people probably should spend a little bit more time with their bankers talking through some of these things more so than just once a year when they get all their loans renewed. Absolutely. So you touched a little bit earlier on about animal performance. Can you talk a little bit about what goes into that animal performance component when people are looking at what types of mixes they're getting? What do they need? What do they need to be aware of? Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of factors that would go into that. We really try to think about what a high-performing natural ecosystem would look like for, for an animal. And, 
you know, most, you know, most people are going to be talking about cattle. So we use cattle as an example here. You know, the the native prairie is is a great template to look at of, you know, how did God create this wonderful system of all these different plants growing together in harmony and and how that supported, you know, these giant herds of bison and 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 now can support, you know, lots of herds of cattle. But number one, we look at how how those plant communities were organized and and it's highly diverse. Now the majority of the biomass came from the grasses, but but there were lots of other forbs and there were legumes and there were flowering species. There were, you know, all sorts of diverse things. And you would see different things express themselves in a dry year than you would see in a wet year. You know, the year would look different or, or the the plant expression would look different based on the environmental conditions. And, and that's because resiliency comes from diversity. And so if you don't have diversity, you may hit a home run, you know, two out of every 10 years, but you may strike out the other eight times. Yes, <laughs> you'll guess it right sometimes, but a lot of times you won't. And so diversity builds in that resiliency for if it's really wet or if it's really dry, if it's really cold, it's really hot, it's a late spring, it's a early spring. Diversity allows something in that mix or in that sward to really express itself, fill in the gaps of the things that are put at a disadvantage because of the current weather conditions. That's how the prairies were. And, and oftentimes we try to mimic that to some extent uh, with our cover crop mixes. So we want to have, ideally, you know, we'd like to have eight to 10 different species representing at least four, if not five or six different plant families uh, and that's important, too, because, you know, I can have eight different grasses out there, but that's not nearly as diverse if I have two legumes, two grasses, and three or four broadleaf plants. And so, but but again, we don't want to just throw things in there to, to count a number and say, well, I had 14 things in there. You only had 12. It has to make sense. It has to make sense for the environment that you're planning it into, the the conditions but also the timing, you know, the timing has to be right as well. So as we get later into the season, you know, deeper into the fall, there's going to be fewer things that work right. And so if you're only planting two or three things because you're planting in October, well, you know what, that's better than planting zero. And so that's, that's just okay. But if you're doing this in August, well, then if you only plant two or three things, you've missed out on the opportunity to introduce a lot of diversity into the system. And, and again, that diversity is what we look at for the animal performance, because animals are much smarter than humans at being able to select the diet that they need for their, you know, whatever they're going through, the, the growing conditions. And you're, not all your animals are going to need exactly the same thing. So you need to have a variety of things uh, for them to be able to select from and to choose from. So again, that diversity allows the animals to if you will, kind of take charge of their own diet to some extent uh, and select the things that uh, are going to be best for, you know, them growing. So with this, with all of this, the one thing we need and haven't talked about is that land that's going to be planted into the cover crops. So some cattle producers who are listening to this show are probably specialized in cattle. And I know some who don't farm at all. So for those people who are interested in cover crops because of the extended grazing season component of it, what tips do you have for them to build those relationships with maybe neighboring farmers or really find a place where they can increase their grazing season with cover crops? Yeah. Yeah. So I'll talk about both things. Number one, you know, if you're primarily a rancher and you mostly just have perennial fields, you know, and that's great. You know, perennials are excellent for soil health. They, you know, you've always got a living root out there. You're keeping the ground covered. So you got a, a couple of the soil health principles covered right off the bat. Sometimes what you struggle with, though, is the diversity, because if it's not more of a native type system, a lot of the diversity may have gone from your system. It can be brought back by better grazing techniques, you know, tighter rotations, more rest time, all those sorts of things. But Certainly one of the things that you can do, and, and, and again, this depends on where you're at, the environment that you're in, but you can look at using 
annuals, annual cover crops interseeded into those perennials at the right times and in the right windows to introduce diversity into the system without really risking, you know, you're, you're rarely going to hurt that perennial crop, uh, especially if you can catch it at a time when it's kind of dormant. So for example, if you've got a warm season pasture and it, it either looks like a, you know, a wet fall or you've got some good moisture, well, you can go out there in the fall, you know, as those warm seasons have gone dormant and you can plant, you know, cereal rye or triticale, winter peas, hairy vetch. There's a number of things that you can plant that will start growing in the fall. They'll overwinter. They'll give you some pretty quick spring growth. You can graze that off and kind of have, you know, that first grazing taken care of before your warm season stuff ever breaks out of dormancy. And, you know, did you use some of the moisture that could have been there for the warm seasons? Yeah, probably, but you know, was it was it worth it if you got an extra ton or two tons of grazing? Probably. You know, I mean that's that's a decision you'll have to make yourself, but you're but you're you're also introducing diversity, you're keeping plants growing and the biology active in that system when the majority of that system would have been dormant. And conversely, you know, if you have cool season pastures, fescue, brome, base pastures like that. You can try to do the same thing in the summer as, as the summer heats up, those cool season grasses especially kind of tend to go dormant. You can interseed things like sorghums and cowpeas and sun hemp and sunflowers and things like that. Try to catch 60 days of the hottest part of the summer. Those cool season grasses grow the least and try to grow these uh, warm season annuals. It's a little riskier because, you know, the chances of catching the right rains that time of year, you know, may not be as good. Just kind of depends on where you're at and it's not going to work every year. Uh, but the years that it does work, man, we've seen some really good results. A guy's growing three, four tons of extra dry matter through a 60 day period in the summertime. And that's just bonus grazing then. Plus it's bonus diversity for your system. We just, we just did a webinar yesterday with Michael Detweiler from Southern Missouri. He's primarily fescue pasture down there in the Ozarks, but he's interceding in both the fall and the summer and having really good success. Now, some years, you know, they'll go through an extended drought period and hardly anything grows, but he's never hurt his fescue. In fact, if he could hurt his fescue, he'd like to, because he'd like to get out of that K31 fescue and into something else. But it's such a tough, tough plant that you can really do a lot of things with these interseeds and 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 never hurt that fescue pasture. So if people are interested in that, you know, we've got some experience. We've got people who are doing it successfully. Uh, you know, we'd be more than happy to visit with them about it. But again, it's like anything else. It all comes with additional requirements for management to make it work right and to make it work properly. And like anything in farming, it's not going to work every year and it's not a cookie cutter approach. You shouldn't do it every year, but it's certainly an option to add diversity. So that, that's the one thing that people can do is just simply look at when their plants are dormant and when they could potentially extend that grazing season within their perennials. And then the other one that you mentioned is, you know, do you have a neighbor, you know, that, you know, has all this crop ground but doesn't have cattle? You know, can you form a partnership with him? Can you say, hey, you've got 500 acres of wheat. I know you just keep it sprayed all year round, you know, to keep the weeds from growing. You know, would you be interested in taking 100 acres, planting a cover crop, and let's see what we can do. So if you have someone like that that you think you can work with, a couple pieces of advice that I would have. Number one, be willing to do as much of the work as possible. And that might mean, hey, I'll line up the seed, I'll put up the fence, I'll take care of the watering. And, you know, and then, you know, you would pay that person less if you're doing a lot of that type of work. But the other thing that I would really, really stress, and I know this is where a lot of landowners, crop guys, are nervous about having the cowboys come in, is you have to be willing to pull your cattle out when it's time. And that means leaving half that biomass there for the farmer, for his field. And, and, and it's hard for a cowboy to leave anything behind, but you have to be willing to do that because otherwise that farmer is going to see all of this residue removed. And like I said earlier, it's properly managed livestock that increases soil health. And it only takes once for that to happen. And that farmer is not going to not only let you back on their ground again, 
but probably anybody else because they only see how it hurts the soil, how it hurts the crop, how it hurts next year's production when it's overgrazed, when it's trampled down too much, when you've left your cattle there too long. So you, I would suggest that you come in with a good plan and say, here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to move this, you know, every so often. And, you know, we're, we're not going to trample anything down too much because we're going to be continually moving. Have a really good plan to go in with. Don't just go in and say, hey, can I graze your ground? You know, take take the initiative, have a good plan and show that it's going to be mutually beneficial for both of you. Do you have customers who have taken that plan of action and have had success with that working with neighbors? Um, yes, I don't know how formally it's been documented. You know, I, I hear more anecdotal type stories. Um, I, I think that there's a lot more people with cattle that are interested in going in and grazing more so than the crop guys interested in bringing cattle in. But, but again, I, I think that a lot of the reluctance on the farm, the, the crop farmers part is just simply there's a lot of unknowns and they probably all have heard stories or seen stories of, you know, stuff getting grazed too much. I think as a cattleman, you need to be proactive about having a plan and maybe even be willing to teach, you know, here's how this can benefit your biology here. You know, hey, if you have an hour, watch this YouTube video where Gabe Brown talks about the benefits of grazing, you know, or, you know, whatever resource that you want to put out there in front of them. But then again, you have to be willing to do the things that are going to make it a good experience for the crop farmer and not a bad one. Well, and I think that it ties into this whole conversation. The reason you would use this practice would be to create something that's mutually beneficial for the soil, for the cattle, for the business. And that would mean all parties involved. Yeah, absolutely. If it's not going to be mutually beneficial, then somebody's going to lose. And the great thing about soil health and regenerative agriculture, whatever you want to call, you know, the movement or the trend, is that it is uniquely a place where everybody can come to the table and nobody has to go away a loser. You know, the farmer can come and get a win. The environment can come to that table and get a win because of, you know, reduced inputs, less pollution, more carbon sequestration, however you want to measure that, it can be a big win there. The consumer uh, should be able to come away from that table with a big win as well, because ultimately, if we have more of this type of production, we are going to produce healthier food, more nutritionally dense food. So it's going to be a win for the consumer. And even the government can come away, you know, from that table with a win for, you know, having healthier products for the food, having an overall healthier a consumer base is just good for, you know, the country as a whole. So it's, it's, it's unique, you know, it doesn't matter if you're Republican or Democrat or whatever flavor you are, you can come to this table. Everybody can kind of agree, you know what, that is a good idea. And, and everybody can kind of find their little piece of the win. And it needs to be that way with a relationship between neighbors as well. You know, if we're going to get together and I'm going to bring my cattle onto your, you know, crop field shade, you know, you need to be assured that, you know, I'm not taking advantage of you and vice versa. We can both go away uh, with a win. And, and, and the people that I've heard talk about that, that's exactly what they say. You know, you have to have a good enough relationship with your neighbor and, and everything needs to be spelled out. You, you can't be vague about, oh, well, I'll take them off sometime in mid-March. No, you have to have a lot more specifics. You have to have, you know, the communication has to be very clear. You know, this is what I'm going to pay. This is who's going to do the fence. This is who's going to do the water. Who's going to come put them in if they get out? That's a big question I'm going to ask if they're not my cattle. And so the more you can communicate and the more clearly that's all laid out, the better the chance that you both have a good, successful uh, outcome from that partnership. So Keith, as we kind of start wrapping up the conversation today, you, you know, you've talked about building those relationships. You've talked about making sure you're doing things correctly so that you see all these benefits. Does green cover have resources that help kind of outline, you know, 
how to do this correctly or what other resources would you recommend? But just because there are going to be variables within different environments, because I have listeners in all 50 states and different countries. So, mm -hmm. you know, what resources or what would you recommend for people who want to make sure that they can do it right in their area? Sure. Well, certainly we would, we would be a good resource to help you decide what cover crop mix to, to use to put in this situation. You know, we're not necessarily going to be the right ones to be a, you know, we're not going to help you drop a contract with your neighbor. We, we could potentially put you in contact with some other people who have done something similar and might be in your area. We might be able to recommend, you know, some, you know, webinar, past webinars or good resources of, information out there on what we like to call YouTube University that would talk about some of these concepts. Certainly we'd be open to helping direct people to, to those right channels. But um, yeah, I, you know, we could certainly be a resource, but there's likely, you know, somebody in your area has done it successfully. You just have to kind of start looking uh, and, and, and maybe not the, the, to the extent of we formed a great partnership with a neighbor, but you know, if, if you're a cattleman and you want to approach a neighbor about grazing their land, well, go to another neighbor who has both cattle and crop ground and ask them and just say, you know, what would be the things that you would want to see if somebody was coming in and grazing your ground? You know, ask them what they would want and then kind of make that list and then figure out how to take that list and go to the other guy and say, you know, here's some things that I'm willing to do to make it a good experience for both of us. So, you know, utilize the people in your area. And sometimes you have to think outside the box in order to figure out who those people to bring onto your team of advisors are. All righty, Keith, is there anything else that we did not talk about today that you really want to share with those listening? Well, there's so much, <laughs> there's so much to share. <laughs> I know, but, you have a lot of knowledge and you could talk uh, for a long time about this. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's a great conversation. And I, I'm really, I really get excited about the thought of regenerative ag, bringing people back together. Because, we, you know, when we talk about regenerative ag, and I know this is not unique to us, many, many people talk about this concept. It starts with regenerating the soil. You know, our mission statement is to help people regenerate, steward, and share God's creation for future generations. Well, it starts with the soil, obviously, with cover crops, soil health and all that. But it certainly doesn't stop there. We want to see people regenerate relationships with neighbors. And so this is one way that that can be done. And then when that starts happening, we can start to regenerate our communities. Because so many rural communities have kind of been decimated with people moving out. Hey, there's no opportunities here. Well, with this type of farming, there can be a lot of opportunities brought back to small rural communities, especially with technology, with good internet, you can start doing your own direct marketing. There are so many opportunities that this type of farming system, this type of management system brings back to the individual. And when we have more individuals doing it, then we can start to see the regeneration of some of our rural communities. And that's very exciting to me. All right, well, thank you for your time today and for sharing a little bit of your knowledge with my listeners here and on the Rancher Mind last month. I appreciate it. Okay. You're welcome, Shay. Thanks for having me. Alrighty, folks, that's a wrap on that one. Thank you, Keith, for taking time to visit with us today. And folks, if you are listening, I can't read your minds. I don't know directly who you are if you're listening. So please go to my website and use the contact us form and let me know your thoughts about this episode. Let me know if you like this topic. Let me know if you don't like this topic. Let me know what topics you want to hear from. Let me know who you want to hear from. I really want to create content that serves you and helps you, but I need your feedback to do that. So take a second, go to the website and just let me know your thoughts. And if you want to make sure that you never miss an episode, so again, once you're on my website, be sure to sign up for the newsletter and then I can send you updates straight to your inbox along with a lot of other great resources each and every week free to you. With that, have a great day and happy ranching.